Lord Sachs, uh, Lord Williams, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to uh, this evening's or this afternoon's lecture. Uh, a very big thank you to the Chief Rabbi, um, who came up slightly earlier in the day to have a private meeting uh, with Cardinal Koch, um, who had to depart quickly for Rome, um, because there were one or two things happening there. Um, I am extremely grateful to the Cardinal for actually making a 24-hour journey um, to come and speak and meet some of the students and, and deliver a lecture. Um, I have the uh, apologies um, not only of the Cardinal but also of uh, Professor Richard Sennett um, who has come down with a raging fever and um, seeing how packed the room is it was a very wise decision of his uh, to uh, remain in bed uh, back in London. Um, this lecture is organised by the Wolf Institute um, in partnership with the Cardinal Bayer Centre uh, at the Gregorian uh, in Rome. Uh, I'm grateful to Father Philip, who I think is sitting here somewhere, but I can't see him there, uh, who is a, a partner uh, in, this, uh, in this creation. Um, before um, I hand over actually to Cardinal Koch, who miraculously will bilocate and appear on the screen behind me uh, for at least two minutes, um, I would uh, like to make one or two announcements that I'm delighted to make. Um, the Wolf Institute uh, has recently signed an agreement with the uh, University of Cambridge um, to provide Cambridge Wolf PhDs, which will be starting in 2013-14. Uh, it's a real tribute to the academic excellence of the Institute and something that I'm absolutely delighted about. And more recently than that, uh, just about two weeks ago, I still haven't signed my part of it, uh, but St Edmunds College uh, and the Wolf Institute signed an academic agreement to pursue joint academic activities, seminars, research projects and so on. Um, and although it's a bit of a squeeze in here, I'm actually delighted that we are at St Edmunds College. I'm very grateful to the Master Paul, Professor Paul Luzio and the Fellows for their encouragement and support. Now, before uh, I hand over uh, to uh, the Master of Magdalen College, as he is now, um, who very kindly has agreed to chair. Uh, just two <coughs> minutes from Cardinal Koch. Um, Lord Chief Rabbi, dear Director Kessler, dear guests, I'm very honoured to be here in Cambridge to have a lecture about trust. It was very important in our world and in the relations, the communal relations, and the relation between Christian and Jews. But I disagree that I cannot hear personally because I must return this evening to Rome. Tomorrow we have the last general audience of our Pope, Benedict XVI, and I hope that you have all a good future in the dialogue between Christian and uh, Jews in England and in all the Commonwealth, and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be not only representing Professor Richard Sennett, a great friend and a great hero of mine, but of course to chair the Chief Rabbi. We go back quite a while, Jonathan and I. Um, we grew our beards at the same rate, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> they turned white with the same rapidity in our <laughs> jobs over the last decade or so. But Jonathan has been, for me, as for so many, a constant beacon of sense and vision in our society and in the religious environment of our society. He has been described as the most influential public intellectual in the United Kingdom and possibly in Europe, speaking from a religious perspective. And I know that the reason we are breathing in and squeezing together this afternoon is precisely because that is what he is. That is the reputation and the authority that he carries, <coughs> well beyond his own community. I treasure memories of welcoming Jonathan at the Lambeth Conference of Anglican Bishops in 2008, when I can truthfully say that his address, touching on ideas of covenant, which I guess will be somewhere around in the mix this afternoon, really made a transforming impact on the discourse of the entire conference and what people were working from and working with in the process of quite a difficult encounter, and I have an abiding debt to Jonathan for what he gave us on that occasion. You'll be familiar with his writings, you'll be familiar with the vision that he shared with us, 
for our society. And, like myself, you'll be eager to hear what he has to say this afternoon. And so without more ado, I'll hand you over to Lord Sachs to enlighten and inspire and infuse and excite us. Friends, it is an enormous pleasure, first of all, to be here uh, to deliver a lecture and to convene this session on behalf of the Wolf Institute, one of the great, great uh, interfaith institutes, one of the great forces for good between faiths in Britain and Europe, to pay tribute to Ed Kessler and his team for the fantastic job they do, to salute and... Um, the, the, the person whose name the Institute bears to salute Lord and Lady Wolf who honor us by their presence here today and Lord and Lady Wolf, Harry and Marguerite, it is so wonderful of you to have given the authority of your name and your eminence to this. Uh, to welcome uh, Father Philip from the Gregorian uh, University, uh, the Cardinal Bear Center, old friends from our visit together uh, with uh, the Pope uh, Benedict uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, especially to say um, what a privilege it is to be sharing a uh, platform with a beloved friend, Rowan. Rowan and I seem to have started a fashion, because I'm the first chief rabbi, I think, to take early retirement. You are the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, His Holiness, he, so... Uh, <laughs> So Rowan's telling me he's very worried about the Dalai Lama, so that's the one to watch. And uh, just finally to add the last footnote on the subject of optimism, and this is a true story actually, and this will show you what the Talmudic mind is actually like. Uh, we were discussing a few years ago with an eminent uh, rabbi from Israel, an eminent Talmudist, and we were talking about the situation, and we asked him, are you an optimist? And he gave the most rabbinical reply I have ever heard. He said, I am not an optimist in the Leibniz sense that this is the best of all possible worlds. Neither am I a pessimist in the Gnostic sense that this is the worst of all possible worlds. So he said, what are you then? What do you believe? He said, I believe that this is the worst of all possible worlds in which there is still hope. <laughs> now, if you can figure that one out, you get rabbinical ordination immediately. <laughs> Friends, I will just say a few words about trust, and then we'll open it out for questions and, and for discussion. But I am very... I, there is a quote that I love from the sociologist Peter Berger who says the following, if we take our minds back many millennia, back into the dawn of history, we may imagine the appearance of the very first intellectual. After centuries, during which people did nothing but rhythmically bang away with stone implements and keep the fires from growing out, there was someone who interrupted these wholesome activities just long enough to have an idea, which he or she then proceeded to announce to the other members of the tribe. We can make a pretty good guess as to what the idea was. The tribe is in a state of crisis. <laughs> so that is what intellectuals are supposed to say, and therefore, let me say, we are in a state of crisis. I think... When it comes to trust, that is probably not an exaggeration. In the United States, for instance, the 2011 CNN poll showed that only 15% of Americans trust the government to do what is right most of the time. 15% down from 70% in the 1960s. Similar declines in all professions. In America, only 7% of employees trust their employers. Extraordinary, extraordinary figure. In Britain, we have seen one group of people after another come into, uh, come into serious question, whether they be 
bankers, CEOs, parliamentarians, journalists, even the police, even the <coughs> religious leadership, media personalities, sports heroes. There's been scandal after scandal that has undermined trust in a way that is quite serious. It's morally serious, but it is also serious in every other way. A financial crisis happens when banks, when in, after 2008, when banks no longer trusted other banks, and therefore the supply of credit froze. In other words, it reminded us just how fundamental things that we think of as very down-to-earth, physical, empirical activities like economics and politics depend on these very spiritual, abstract, moral ideas. Credit comes from the Latin credo, to believe. Fiduciary responsibility comes from the Latin for faith. Trust is an almost religious word. It is a religious word. And yet it is that on which any economy, indeed any institution, any society depends. And therefore, at such times when on both sides of the Atlantic there is an acknowledged crisis of trust, it's appropriate to ask ourselves, Fundamental questions. What is trust? Why is it important? What creates it and sustains it? What damages and destroys it? What happens when trust breaks down? Is it mere coincidence that it has happened in so many spheres at the same time? And does this have some kind of religious dimension? And I want to begin by telling a story. It is... <coughs> to my mind, one of the most exciting of all intellectual adventures, and it took place over the 100 or so, 130 years between, uh, well, we start with Adam Smith, but it very much accelerated in the 1970s and 1980s, and I find this a thrilling story. You may be familiar with it, please forgive me if I just tell it, because I like hearing it, I like stories. So we begin with Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, and the axiom on which the market economy depends. You remember that Adam Smith famously said, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. This was the transforming idea of the 18th century and Manneville had mentioned it, uh, Montesquieu mentioned it, but it's most famously associated with Adam Smith, that it is the magic of the market that turns individual self-interest into collective gain. And indeed, he gave it an almost mystical, almost spiritual resonance because he called it famously the invisible as if divine providence was somehow taking our lesser inclinations and turning them into the collective good. And that was the central dogma of market economics. However, and of course it was challenged by other systems, communism, socialism, but what is interesting is how three disciplines came together in the 19th and 20th centuries to throw doubt on this principle. And we begin with story one, which began in 1944. There was a brilliant guy, uh, John von Neumann, who was famous for developing computing. He was involved in uh, the development of, of the atomic bomb. He was a <laughs> nuclear physicist and so on. But John von Neumann's father was a banker, and they used to talk business over the dinner table. So, uh, yeah... They didn't have a rabbi there. What can they do? You shouldn't. You're supposed to talk about other things on the Sabbath, but never mind. They spoke about business. Okay, so John von Neumann knew that economic theory, as it existed in those days, those supply and demand curves and perfect competition and all the rest of it, was radically inadequate to describe how people actually make financial decisions. Because the whole assumption of economics until then, which is that you can get perfect information and you can know what the supply and demand are going to be and so on, actually ignored the central fact of all economic behavior, which is that the results of what I do 
will depend on how you respond to what I do. And I cannot know that in advance. And in order, and, and that is the determinant. How can you act under conditions of uncertainty when you don't know how your partner, your competitor, or the market will respond to what you do? And in order to uh, create a theory that was more realistic, he created a new branch of mathematics known as games theory. And that was the 1944 <coughs> chapter one in the story. In 1951, somebody produced a little anomaly in games theory, which has become very famous since, called the prisoner's dilemma. You know, the prisoner's dilemma says, the police arrest two people, honest, it wasn't me, sorry, uh, Lord Blair, uh, but the police arrest two people, they haven't got sufficient evidence to convict them of a crime, they only have minor evidence of a minor infraction. All they have to depend on separating the two and putting pressure on but each of them to inform on the other. And to do so, they propose a deal. If you inform on the other person and the other person stays silent, he gets 10 years in jail, you go free. If you both inform on one another, you both get five years. If you stay absolutely silent, then you will each only be convicted for a minor crime and you will be sentenced to one year each. Now, what is interesting about the prisoner's dilemma is that it is very easy to see that for each prisoner, the best option is to inform on the other. That means that in the worst case scenario, you only suffer five years in prison, and in the best case scenario, you walk free. Whereas if you stay silent, the risk is you get, worst case scenario, 10 years imprisonment, and the best case scenario, one year in prison. So each has a reason to inform on the other. The end result is they both go to jail for five years, which is not the best outcome, because if they had both stayed silent, they would have got out four years earlier. Now, the interesting thing about the prisoner's dilemma is although it sounds just like a mathematical curiosity, what it was, was as damaging to Adam Smith's economics as Einstein was to Newtonian physics. It was a spanner in the works of market economics. Market economics depends on the idea that if we each pursue our own rational self-interest, the result is good for everyone. Whereas what the prisoner's dilemma shows is that if we each pursue our own self-interest, the result is bad for everyone. And this was the first fundamental refutation of Adam Smith's market economics. And of course, why did it happen? Because in that situation, the two prisoners don't trust one another. That is why it happened. And that began to hint at the fact that in the absence of trust, the market economy will not produce results that are good for everyone and may produce results that are bad for everyone. The absence of trust demolishes the case for the market economy. So that was the next stage. The next stage beyond that involved... Um, Neo-Darwinians. Darwin was absolutely fascinated by one <laughs> phenomenon that he observed um, that seemed to refute his theory of natural selection. Darwin couldn't work out how come there were still any altruists anymore. Can you work this out? Natural selection should select against altruists because, as Darwin pointed out, if an individual risks his life for the sake of the group, that individual is likely to die younger than other individuals who play it safe and stand at the back of the room. And the end result is the altruist should die first and eventually die out. And yet Darwin discovered that altruism was highly valued in every human society that anyone had ever come across. So how on earth was altruism uh, possible on the theory of natural selection? Darwin offered an answer, but the matter remained indeterminate until 
the 1970s. When the 1970s came along, powerful computers were available for the first time. And sociobiologists, neo-Darwinians, were able to test the answer to the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma says the following, that if these two criminals who got somehow persuaded to inform on one another, if they did this time after time after time, they would eventually learn that if they just both kept quiet, it would be better for both of them. In other words, if you have repeated instances, it, the iterated prisoner's dilemma, the two parties eventually learn to trust one another and act for their collective good, which turns out to be for each of their individual goods. So availability of large-scale computing allowed a uh, political scientist, Robert Axelrod, to announce an international competition for the computer program <coughs> that would program a species best able to survive repeated encounters with strangers whom you don't know how they're going to behave towards you. In other words, a lot of times playing um, the game theory and the prisoner's dilemma. And this was won by a Canadian <coughs> called Anatole Rappaport, and the winning program was called Tit for Tat which says as follows, if you meet a stranger, be nice to them. Then do exactly what they do to you. So if the stranger responds to your being nice, by being nice, you carry on being nice. If the stranger responds by being nasty, then be nasty. And eventually the stranger will learn that it pays to be nice rather than nasty, because if you're not, he's nasty to you, you'll be nasty to him. This is called by biologists, reciprocal altruism. It's called measure for measure, and it is the principle of retributive justice. As you do to others, so shall, shall it be done to you. And the nice story about this is that in 1989, a Polish mathematician now at Harvard called uh, Martin Novak invented a program that beats tit for tat. It's called Generous. And generous beats tit for tat because you can work out that if you meet a really nasty person and they're nasty to you, you have to be nasty to them and they get nastier to you and you get caught up in a cycle of vengeance and retaliation of the kind that we know throughout the world. So how do you break the cycle? And Martin Novak worked out that you can break the cycle by programming the computer regularly but randomly to ignore the last move of the other person. In other words, you start being gratuitously nice, even when the person's been nasty to you. In other words, if you can train the computer, non-predictably, but relatively often, to ignore a slight, if you can train the computer to forget, you get a program that beats tit for tat. And forgetting is the nearest a computer gets to forgiving. It's the computer equivalent of forgiving. So it turns out that as a result of the 1970s and 1980s studies of reciprocal altruism, it turns out that a computer came up with the answer that if you want a good set of arrangements between strangers who encounter one another in unpredictable ways, you need tit-for-tat and generous, in other words, justice and mercy. The basic principles of the Judeo-Christian ethic established by computer, which must, I think, relieve the almighty considerably. <laughs> so there we are. It worked. We now know, therefore, why altruism is, is actually a very effective thing, because altruists learn to get on with one another. And if you learn to get on with one another, you then take advantage of the following fact that if it's a contest, we will not go into football teams here because, you know, I have support a football team that is a permanent test of faith. So uh, <laughs> let's just talk about humans and lions. One man versus one lion, lion wins. Ten men versus lion, then the men stand a chance. So if your way of responding to strangers allows you, through reciprocal altruism and forgiveness, 
to construct a good, a good group relationship, you will stand a better chance of survival than otherwise. And that is the point that Darwin makes in his book, The Descent of Man. It is an argument currently being fought between E.O. Wilson of Harvard and, and Richard Dawkins of another place, whether, whether natural selection works on the basis of group selection or individual selection. But the truth is that uh, it's, it's, it, it's a fairly irrelevant point because we hand on our genes as individuals, but we survive and only survive as members of groups. So therefore, when you have a high level of trust that emerges from repeated encounters between people who learn to live together without betraying one another's trust, if you have a high level of trust, then you have a group that will flourish, whereas if you have a high level of suspicion, fear, anxiety, corruption, and cynicism, then the group will not cohere and you will fail. We can therefore now establish, through uh, the pri iterated prisoner's dilemma, through, um, through uh, Axelrod and, 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 and Marty Novak, the following formula, which Darwin fully understood, which is that arenas of competition, biology, natural selection, competition for scarce resources, or the market economy, competition for wealth, or liberal democratic politics, competition for power. There will only be human flourishing. There will only be human survival if, as well as competition, there is also cooperation. And therefore, cooperation must be institutionalized in society and that depends on habits that induce trust. That, however, raises the question, where in a liberal democratic society will you find the arenas that create cooperation, not just competition? And the short answer is that we need environments in which two things happen. Number one, we encounter one another repeatedly. You know, that is the reason why uh, there is more crime and more incivility in cities than there is in little villages. Because I am more likely to take advantage of you if I think I'm never going to see you again than if I have to meet you uh, the, tomorrow in the local shop or in the pub. Iterated prisoner's dilemma means habits of trust only occur when there are repeated encounters between the same individuals. We can therefore now say why it is that families and communities and neighborhoods, all the things that make up civil society, are the places where we learn trust. Because they are the homes of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. In families and communities, in neighborhoods, among friends, that is where we have those repeated encounters which teach us not to be ruthless with one another but to cooperate because ruthlessness with one another results in, 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 in consequences that are bad for you and bad for me. And those are the relationships to which in my Lambeth lecture that, that Rowan mentioned I called covenantal relationships as opposed to contractual ones. Contractual relationships in a contract, two or more individuals, each pursuing their own interest, come together to make an exchange for mutual benefit. So there are commercial contracts that create the market, there is a social contract that creates the state. A covenant is something different. In a covenant, two or more individuals, each respecting the dignity and the integrity of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust to share their interests, sometimes even to share their lives by pledging faithfulness to one another to do together what neither can do alone. A contract is a transaction. A covenant is a relationship. 
Or to put it slightly differently, a contract is about interests, while a covenant is about identity. It's about you and me coming together to form an us. That is why contracts benefit, but covenants transform. So economics and politics, the market and the state, are about the logic of competition, but covenant is about the logic of cooperation, and cooperation is what creates trust. And that is why we need a strong civil society about which, I mean, which Professor Sennett, uh, speedy recovery, but he just written a lovely book called Together, celebrating those contexts in which we do come together in, in covenantal relations, in which neither is seeking wealth at the cost of the other or power at the cost of the other. Now, once you define trust in this way, then you see that this is the essential theme of the Hebrew Bible. It is certainly a, a central theme of the Judeo-Christian tradition, but I'm just talking for a moment as a Jew. It is absolutely central to the Hebrew Bible. The real issue of the Hebrew Bible is how do you con combine freedom, human freedom, and order? You can have order without freedom. You can have freedom without order. How do you create them both? So Genesis begins with three stories in which God gives human beings freedom and they misuse that freedom. Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. Cain kills Abel. And immediately we find ourselves in the generation of the flood, Hobbes' state of nature, the war of all against all, the world filled with violence. So Genesis begins with freedom misused, and the result is chaos, freedom without order. Exodus begins in the exact opposite point of order without freedom. The Egypt of the pharaohs, where order is secured at the cost of slavery. And the key institution that allows the coexistence of free human beings without any coercive force a, a relationship built on trust. And, and the person who really saw this was, was Nietzsche in his book, The Genealogy of Morals, and also Hannah Arendt in her book, The Human Condition. The key institution that combines freedom and order is the act of making a promise. When I make a promise... I freely place myself under an obligation on which you can rely. And therefore, I've created an order which I have freely embraced. So that act of promising, uh, that use of language as a performative utterance, uh, God creates the natural world with words. We create the social world with words and those performative utterances making a promise. And the act of mutual promise, where X promises Y and Y promises X, is called in Hebrew Brit, which is the Hebrew for covenant. And that is the defining moment in Judaism. That summit of the book of Exodus in Exodus 19 and 20, when God and the Israelites enter into a mutually binding pledge, a promise to act for one another and to stay loyal to one another. And the result is a covenantal society in which our trust in God and God's trust in us translates into a society in which trust is a collective property of the society in which I trust others and others are able to trust me. The Hebrew word emunah, which we translate as faith, really means trust. Abraham had faith in God when he said you will have a child. That means he trusted God to act on his promise. The Hebrew word emet, which means true, really has no connection with the word true in English. It means doing what you said you were going to do. You are truthful, but you honor your promises. When we say God is true. When Jacob says, I am unworthy of all your kindness and your truth, this means a God who keeps his promises. Someone who is true is somebody who honors promises, i.e. someone who is trustworthy. 
Now, I have therefore argued for many, many years that a market economy depends on virtues that are not themselves created by a market economy and may be undermined by the market economy. Because the market economy cannot deliver without trust, and trust is a property not of an economic relationship, a transaction, it's the result not of a contract but of a covenant. Without trust, the market economy fails in the way that the prisoner's dilemma says it will fail, and the end result will be bad for all of us. Now, this is a theoretical story of ideas that I find fascinating because it's not a religious story, it involves maths, biology, and all the rest of it. It's a very, very interesting story, but it actually works. And when that trust breaks down, the result is, is tragic, and we surely all know this. I had... Um, the privilege of knowing a man, I, I won't name him, who hurt, but was widely seen as Britain's leading industrialist over a period of some 50 years. Um, I knew him in the last years of his life. He was not a religious man, but he came to the synagogue on our day of atonement. That, you know, that's a day of fasting and praying, which usually does, it, it makes you feel pious for a year, so you don't have to come to the next day of the day. But he was a wonderful man, deeply moral, who wept at our last conversation. He said, my successor is paying himself more than ten times what I paid myself, and he is destroying everything I built. And he did. That's what happens when trust is betrayed. There's a wonderful story told by Lord Seif, da David Seif, I imagine, his autobiography, Don't Ask the Price. Marks and Spencers used to insist that their suppliers gave their employees good working conditions. There was one firm that had supplied Marks and Spencers with textiles for years and years and years, and Marks and Spencers were not satisfied with the recreational and canteen facilities it had for its workers. And it said to the supplier, you have to improve those facilities or we will cease to do business with you. The company thought the Marks and Spencers were bluffing. They had been their suppliers for decades. They wouldn't take their customer away. They didn't improve the facilities. Marks and Spencers ceased to do business with them and they went bankrupt. And that, and, and, and to take a very unobvious patron saint, of, well, I'm sure I, I don't want to judge him harshly, but to take George Soros, you know, not our obvious first candidate for sainthood, but uh, George Soros has a very interesting story to tell about what happened to him initially when he became an investment manager. He says for the first two or three years, my only job was establishing my character. People had to know that to do business with me I was someone they could trust. He said, that is not done anymore. How is it done now? You get in the lawyers. You do these watertight contracts, and, you know, you rely on the lawyers to, to make sure that if the guy is not honest, you, you will recover your losses. The whole concept of character and trust turned out to be central to um, British industrial giants, a retail giant like Marks and Spencers, and even a, a very speculative activity like uh, investment management, good business depends on that set of principles that allow people to trust one another. Principles like mutual benefit, honesty, integrity, fi fiduciary responsibility, accountability, transparency, equity, and so on. And that constitutes an environment of trust without which companies will fail, banks will fail, the economy will fail, and society will spin apart. But that depends on understanding the logic of the prisoner's dilemma. If we think, as we have been told so often for a half century and more, that the only thing that really matters is self-interest, does it work for you? Is it good for you? Are you worth it? If that is the only force driving the economy and, 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 and politics and that there's no area of culture that is dedicated to covenantal relationships, 
then the pursuit of self-interest will in the long run be adverse, hostile to self-interest. You cannot build a society on the basis of a political and economic structure alone. You need families, communities, congregations, civil societies, which run on the basis of the logic of cooperation uh, rather than competition. And those are the environments in which trust is born. Absent that, and we are in trouble. So let me end just with two quotes. One from the political philosopher Michael Walzer, who puts it very bluntly. He says, we are perhaps the most individualist society that ever existed in human history. Compared certainly to earlier and old world societies, we are radically liberated, all of us. Free to plot our own course, to plan our own lives, to choose a career, to choose a partner or a succession of partners, to choose a religion or no religion to choose a politics or an anti-politics, to choose a lifestyle, any style. Free to do our own thing. And this freedom, energizing and exciting as it is, is also profoundly disintegr disintegrative, making it very difficult for individuals to find any stable communal support, very difficult for any community to count on the responsible participation of its individual members. It opens solitary men and women to the impact of the lowest common denominator, commercial culture. It works against commitment to the larger democratic union and also against the solidarity of all cultural groups that constitute our multiculturalism. So this individualism comes at a price and it is ultimately the breakdown of a relationship which means the loss of trust. And the person who said it most bluntly, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all, was Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, for Bertrand Russell, the great heights of Western civilization were classical Greece and Renaissance Italy. But he writes the following in, he, in the introduction to his history of Western philosophy. He says, what happened in the great age of Greece happened again in Renaissance Italy. Traditional moral restraints disappeared because they were seen to be associated with superstition. The liberation from fetters made individuals energetic and creative, producing a rare fluorescence of genius. But the anarchy and treachery, which inevitably resulted from the decay of morals, <coughs> made Italians collectively impotent, and they fell, like the Greeks, under the domination of nations less civilized than themselves but not so destitute of social cohesion. <coughs> lose social cohesion, <coughs> lose trust on which it's built, you lose everything. In short, a culture of individualism and self-interest cannot be a culture of trust, and it cannot be the viable basis of society. I've tried to put forward a very minimalist argument. I haven't said that religion understands business ethics better than business people. I haven't said you're going to be honest because if you believe that God's watching you fiddling the books. I haven't said you'll be honest because religion alone has moral certainty. I haven't echoed Max Weber and said it was the Protestant ethic that gave birth to, Catholic, uh, to the capitalism or Michael Novak who wrote a book called The Catholic Ethic and the Spirit of Prod uh, Capitalism and I certainly didn't mention... One of Sombart who blamed it all on the Jews. So, uh, you know, I, I just a minimalist thing, which is that communities of faith are places that are guardians of what we call social capital, of trust, because they're there to support families and communities and charities to work together for the common good, not individual good. And therefore, religious groups, together with other groups and other modes of solidarity, must work to restore our badly depleted store of trust. I think Jews, Christians, Muslims, and people of all other faiths and of none should join forces to bring morals back to markets, trust back to institutions. And I know that our, my own tradition, the great Jewish tradition, has always believed that business is and the economy is a moral enterprise. Let us renew our sources of moral energy by rebuilding relationships of trust. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. We have about um, half an hour or so for 
questions and discussion. And while people are shaping their questions, may I just start the ball rolling um, with one thought which I'd be interested to hear your reaction to. The, the tit for tat program takes for granted predictable behavior. But of course, predictable behavior can be a treadmill in which nothing ever breaks a vicious cycle. And it seemed to me that part of what you were saying was that faithfulness or dependability is not the same as predictability. To break through from the level of predictable reaction to a level of faithful or trustful or dependable relationship requires something more than just a reliance on what can be predicted. Therefore, some major act of imagination and li liberty, or grace, as you might say in our trade. And I just wonder if you recognize that distinction between the predictable and the faithful. Um, very much so, and, and that, that to me is um, the extraordinary phenomenon <coughs> of, of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the one action that is not a reaction. The reaction is to uh, repay evil by evil. To repay evil by forgiveness is the introduction of unpredictability into human affairs and therefore the ultimate assertion of freedom. One who can forgive is free and thereby affirms human freedom. Forgiveness does this magical thing. It liberates us from the burden of the past. You know, if we are totally unforgiving, then we are mired in a past which we have to endlessly replay. And I remember the moment when I felt this very strongly. I, did, I always do a little television program around the Jewish New Year, and in 1999, we did it in Pristina, because the NATO um, action in Pristina was just coming to an end, the three or 100,000 or so uh, uh, Kosovo Albanians, uh, Muslims were coming back. And I was standing in the main square, where we covered in bomb rubble. And I said, you know, this is where you see the power of a single word to change history. Because if the two sides can learn to forgive one another, they will have a future. If they can't, they will be replaying the 1389 Battle of Kosovo for all time. So I think forgiveness is the major unpredictability in human behavior that allows us to liberate ourselves from destructive cycles. Let's take some questions. Who'd like to start? Yeah, everyone wants to ask the second question, but now let's <laughs> do you something you can. So, yes. Oh. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, as you spoke, about the implicit covenant within a contract, because you were saying that the, the contract each gains something specific, the covenant, covenant requires trust. But do you think that within the contract there's an implicit covenant as well? Because to take your example of the butcher selling the meal, the person buying it has to also have a trust that what they're buying is what they think they're buying. <laughs> <laughs> and the butcher receiving the money has to, if it's a check, have trust that that won't bounce, or if it's cash, have trust that he will be able to spend it within the economy. So is, is there an implicit covenant there as well that stands a risk of being lost in certain types of market economy, but retained in other types that are built more on trust as well as contract? It's, it's, it's obvious, it's, you're absolutely right what, what uh, what Adam Smith was saying is, if you know the butcher and the baker, uh, it's going to be in their interests to do what they say they're going to do, and it's going to be in your, in your interest to pay with a check that doesn't bounce, or a, a credit card with some credit in it. Um, so there is that kind of trust built into very simple economic transactions. Um, but that kind of
kind of trust gets strained, the more remote those transactions become. So, for instance, you know, the, the securitization of risk uh, that led to, you know, the, 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 the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, was one in which, you know, some individuals may well, you know, the people who were entering into that were um, not fully familiar with what exactly was being done. And those people who were undertaking it had secured such wonderful golden parachutes that they didn't particularly stand to lose if it all came unstuck and so on and so forth. Um, in general, um, the, fir the more remote actors are, the more they can get away with dishonesty. That's basically it. And, um, you know, it may well be that it's not accidental that the prisoner's dilemma did not emerge until after World War II when, for instance, with aerial bombing, people were very remote from the direct consequences of their actions. So I think in very simple economies, trust is built into to everyday contracts. But the more complex the economies, and the more long-term the consequences, the harder it is to rely on that trust. Although, I may be wrong. I may be wrong, because Amazon.com, I'm, I'm not free advertising here, but it, it, they've come up with this very interesting technique of, of generating trust. Because um, I never get to a bookshop, so and I can't sleep, so I spend my insomniac hours surfing Amazon.com, which is... Uh, my, my favorite pastime, and, uh, and uh, you know, the wonderful thing is that they've got a system where readers can give four stars or five stars or what have you, and they've even got a double system, which says 26 readers found this comment helpful. So it may be that you can generate impersonal systems of trust. I don't know. It's a big question I had when I was constructing this. Can you generate impersonal systems of trust. But I do feel, in the end, that certainly as far as financial uh, authorities have, 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 have been uh, active or inactive, the financial authorities in both the states and Britain failing to detect the warning signals early enough, it seemed to me that there was a built-in problem with relying on external regulation. Because the the people who have an interest in defeating the regulation get paid higher salaries than the people employed to apply the regulation. So it could just be that you get people an inbuilt tendency to outsmart even the cleverest regulation. So I'm not sure about impersonal systems, but if you're just buying bread from the local baker, I think you can trust them, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right at the back. Uh, Robert Knox, you oh. spoke about the meaning of the word the covenant, belief in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And um, as far as I know, by definition, all covenants in the Bible involve uh, asymmetrical uh, relationship. As in, uh, it's always a powerful side, a king or a god, that gives a covenant. Do, do you think that that is also due to the covenantal relationships that you describe in the modern world? Um, covenants asymmetrical. Actually, if you look very carefully through the Hebrew Bible, you see a very interesting pattern. God's covenant with Noah is unilateral. God doesn't ask Noah's permission. God's covenant, and that's in Genesis 9. In Genesis 17, God makes a covenant with Abraham, but God doesn't ask Abraham to agree to the covenant, but he does ask him to perform an act, a rather painful one, in response to that covenant. Um, the covenant at Sinai is a mutual covenant, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, and all subsequent covenants, the covenant renewal at the end of Deuteronomy in J Moses' life, the covenant in Joshua 20, 24 at the end of Joshua's life, and the other covenant renewals in the reigns of uh, Hezekiah, Josiah, and Ezra, and Nehemiah are all done in human initiative. So you have two covenants at divine initiative and five covenant renewal ceremonies at human initiative. It's only the one in the middle, in the book of Exodus, that is genuinely reciprocal. Read Genesis 19 very carefully and you say, you will hear 
But God says to Moses, go and, pres pr go and, uh, and present to the Israelites this relationship. You will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and I, I, because I brought you out from Egypt on eagles' wings. And it is only when the people give their assent, all that God has said we will do, in Exodus 19, and again twice in Exodus 24, that that covenant can be had. It is, in other words, a reciprocal covenant. Now, you will know from the reading of the Talmud that um, um, the Talmudic rabbis were not convinced that it was entirely reciprocal. Um, they said, the Talmud in uh, Tractate Shabbat, page 87, he says, that God gave the Israelites an entirely free choice this is a rabbinic gloss on Exodus 19. It says he lifted up Mount Sinai, suspended it over the Israelites, and said, if you agree, then we have a covenant. If not, this is your funeral. Goodbye. <laughs> like the synagogue president who used to say it's a free vote, all those in favor say aye, all those against say aye, resign. So uh, the rabbis weren't entirely convinced that this was a fully equal reciprocal covenant between two equal partners. Uh, but they gave the answer that they gave, that uh, the covenant was renewed on the festival of Purim, which we've just celebrated. So one covenant had to be mutual and reciprocal. Uh, and the Jewish mystics gave this, the idea of tzimtzum, that God has to limit himself to make space for human beings to be free, to be able to say yea or nay. So um, in Judaism, covenant has to be free. And it has to be reciprocal. At least the one in the middle has to. And the ones before were all at God's initiative, and the, the ones after were all at human initiative. Another question. Um, let's see. Uh, yes. How does one teach or initiate trust in a, a group or an institution or an organization? that has forgotten how to trust or, or has never learned to? That, that has forgotten or never learned how to trust? How uh, do you initiate Rowan, could trust? I ask you that question? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you to, no, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I'm just fascinated. When you, when you have gone into a human situation where there's been a breakdown of trust, can you think of such a... <laughs> I can indeed, yes. <laughs> so, um, that's, I think, why I, I began with the question I did about how you break through vicious cycles of predictability. And I think what you have to, to do with parties in that sort of situation, if they're in a negotiating mood, or if they're willing to, to explore, is to ask a, a succession of questions like what for you would be the kind of change you wish to see within a limited time frame what's the change you are seeking what in your experience say the last few years has held you back from the change you're seeking what would secure that kind of change in the longest possible reach in the future because I think if you, if you configure it with questions like that, somewhere in the middle of that, there will be a question arising of how you make a decision which renders you trustworthy to another. And you may see how that begins to unlock it. I mean, that, that's a very abstract reply in a sense, but I'm thinking of those cases where trust has broken up, where in pastoral situations, in parishes, in larger ecclesiastical <coughs> units. And I think one just has to keep coming back to that sort of question. What do you want to happen? Why isn't it happening? What would what would give it the longest possible reach and the greatest stability? I think my answer would be very similar, but to just talk you into this situation is, is actually quite complicated because one of the weirdest things I have been called on to do, given that I've tried over the years to do all I can to be supportive of marriage as an institution, is that once in a while I'm called on to facilitate a divorce. I don't know, Jews will understand what I'm talking about, so I better explain this to, to non-Jews here. 
In Judaism, we have a problem called the aguna, uh, a woman whose marriage is broken down, whose husband, who, who may well have gone through a civil divorce, but whose husband is withholding a Jewish divorce. And the result is that this woman is unable to remarry uh, in a synagogue. She's unable to, and if she has a relationship or, or does get married, then there are huge stigmas attaching to the children of such a second marriage. So we have to resolve these cases. And Jewish divorce law and Jewish marriage law are very unlike civil law because they are totally dependent on individual assent. There's no marriage without consent, there's no divorce without consent, and there has to be consent of both parties. A court cannot order a divorce against the will of either of the partners. So even at the time when I'm trying to strengthen marriage, I have had occasions when we have had to mediate a divorce. And in these cases, you're dealing with cases where there's a complete breakdown of trust, with this huge burden of acrimony. These cases have gone through civil courts, through rabbinic courts, and there's just a total breakdown of relationship, and each feels the other is out to gain an unfair advantage. And there is absolutely no way of dealing with such issues except through mediation. And when I came to this, uh, when I had to deal with the first of such cases, and we've done a few, and we've done them all successfully, I realized that the biggest single requirement was listening. Um, somebody once wrote a book about the Clinton primary in the form of a novel. Do you remember it was written by Anonymous? Somebody called Joe Klein, other known to his friends as Anonymous, called Primary Colors. And in Primary Colors, Early on in the book, there's a wonderful phrase which described Bill Clinton going into a room. The phrase was, aerobic listening. <laughs> I love that phrase, aerobic listening. So to solve this case, these cases with a complete breakdown in trust, I asked a speech therapist, sadly no longer alive, whom we knew. She, was, she had nothing to do with marriage or counseling or anything. Her role in life was to cure kids who had a stammer but she was the most aerobic listener I ever came across. So the principle was that we would sit around a very small round table in our middle room, which you must remember, Brown, I've used it for all mediation purposes. It's a circular table, which is quite small, so however many people, whenever we have to resolve a conflict, we use this table, which is now wobbling after the pressure of 22 years of conflict resolution. <laughs> And we just sat with the couple and listened aerobically for a day, for seven or eight hours. And we sucked all the tension and the animosity and the <coughs> distrust and mistrust out of it. The thing we had to do was establish one thing they both cared about, which in these cases was, was children. They both said, okay, yeah, I'm, you know, we're going to put the interests of our child or our children first. The second you can establish common ground, what the Harvard, the MIT book on negotiation, getting to yes calls, focus on interests, not positions. Uh, do you know getting to yes is a very important book? Um, once you can listen, then when both sides feel they have been heard, that is when trust is re-established. This requires a lot of pain on both sides because both sides are going to say things that they feel very deeply but are deeply hurtful to the other side. And therefore you have to provide a safe holding environment. And that's your job as the mediator to provide a safe environment where each side feels safe to speak the truth as they see it and the other side feels safe that they're not going to be injured by this act of listening. And that careful act of listening, um, which takes hours to unload the mistrust <coughs> and, the, and the, the sense of betrayal, um, is actually an epiphany when it works. And I felt this so strongly that some of you may know the holiest line in Jewish prayer 
is the line from Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And in the prayer book, the new prayer book that I translated for our Anglo jury, I changed the translation of Shema, which means several things in Hebrew, to listen, Israel. Listening in Judaism is the supreme religious act. And actually, I once uh, picked up a, uh, a wonderful quote from uh, Mother Teresa who defined prayer as listening to God, listening to us. So I think that's how you deal with it. It has You have to provide a safe environment in, people, in which people can honestly speak their sense of betrayal. And the other person has to be seen to have heard that and taken it on board. You can't always repair broken trust. Not every broken relationship can be mended. But it can be done, and when it's done, it's very miraculous. I, I ask myself, why was it that in the 19th and 20th centuries, when, when mainland Europe really, you know, from France to Germany to Austria all the way to Russia was held by this virus of anti-Semitism. Why did it not appear in anything like that degree in Britain and America? What was the difference? I mean, here's a democracy, there's a democracy. What if, here's a market economy, there's a market economy. <coughs> the honest answer that I can give it may be simplistic, but I think it's, it's, it's empirically persuasive, is that Britain and America in the 19th century had extremely active civil society. That's what Alexis de Tocqueville discovers when he goes to America. You know, something's wrong, you start a committee. Uh, start a charity, you know, get six Jews together, they want to know what are we raising money for. That's, that's what he discovered in America. He called it the art of association, and he gave it that wonderful phrase, he called it the apprenticeship in liberty, to be able to form these civil societies. Now, that happened in Britain at the same time. Now, throughout Victorian England, you know, in the 1820s, it was not safe to walk the streets of London. There was a lot of mugging, a lot of delinquency, a lot of abandoned children, a lot of drunkenness. By 1850, British society had been very dramatically remoralized. The main agent of that actually was Sunday schools, was churches, Sunday schools, and, and a whole set of voluntary associations, which in the early years were mainly Christian, but later there were friendly societies and all sorts of, you know, um, um, left-wing and secular groups and, and so on, which led <coughs> Durkheim to believe that trade unions might be the churches of the future and so on. I think that the real political message, and I wrote a book about this called The Politics of Hope, is that you need a strong civil society. And that is what uh, Britain and America had. It, Europe didn't particularly have it. Uh, Hegel thought civil society was... I don't speak German. Borg, 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 Borg. You know, it was sort of, you know, it, it was, you know, in discreet lack of charm of the bourgeoisie. It was self-centered. He didn't like civil society. Rousseau hated any intermediate association that got in the way of the identification of the individual with the state, the volonté générale. So French and German thought did not value civil society, British and American thought did value civil society, and I believe that's what made them tolerant societies and high trust societies in a way that Europe was, was not. Um, and therefore, has this got to do with secularization per se? No, it's got to do actually with the things that form communities. However, I wrote a piece in the Times about the on Saturday about Britain's first church of atheism. Why, why is one not surprised to discover it's located in Islington? It's, uh, everyone, everyone gets together and sings Freddie Mercury's Don't Stop Me Now and various and uh, what, Stevie Wonder's Superstition, etc., etc. And 
I, I'd love to take it. No, I, I'm not a gambling man, but will that church still be well and strong five years from now? Are you with me? If you are under a religious obligation, God has commanded, thus saith the Lord, then you turn up in church, then you turn up in synagogue. But if you only do it because you like seeing old Queen songs from the 70s, you know, you'll do it for as long as you enjoy doing it, and then you won't. So, that's what the quote from Michael Walzer was about. Can you, in a very individualistic society, create genuine bonds of community. And that is why the really interesting story from the States is the famous story of a guy, the Harvard sociologist called Robert Putnam. Robert Putnam was famous for his 1996 article called Bowling Alone, in which he discovered that more Americans than ever are going 10-pin bowling, but fewer than ever are joining 10-pin bowling leagues. So, he called it bowling alone, the individualist, the individual society. And that was a society low on social capital. In 2010, Robert Putnam wrote, published a book called American Grace, in which he shows, after four years of research, that social capital or trust is alive and well in America, and where will you find it? in churches, in synagogues, in mosques. It's there in religious communities. And he goes down the whole list of things from helping find a job for a neighbor who's unemployed to allowing somebody to cut in front of you in a queue, a whole long list of altruistic things. And on almost all of them, uh, your likelihood to do the altruistic thing is directly correlated by the number of times you turn up in a house of worship. So attending a house of worship regularly is very good for altruism. It's also good for longevity. Uh, somebody <laughs> discovered that if you go regularly to a house of worship, you uh, live seven years longer. Or as I said to my wife when I first read this statistic, maybe it just seems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in other words, Faith comes into this because it turns out that faith is very good at building communities and building communities is very good at building trust. And the reason I wrote The Politics of Hope was to tell politicians, you need us. Because don't expect the government and the market to do it all. Um, I'm not sure if they read it. Gordon Brown wrote the preface to the paperback edition, so I think he read it. But just in case they hadn't read it, I presented all three party leaders a year ago with a copy of Robert Putnam's American Grace. So, and we'll find out whether they read it or not. <laughs> yeah, whether it, but you take the point. We do need faith communities as part of our social ecology. Sometimes we are too trusting. At the lowest moments of my life, I did say to Elaine, my wife, on my gravestone, we'll read the saddest line in the English language, he trusted people. So we know that if you trust, that trust can be betrayed. And therefore every one of us has to come to the existential decision how shall we live? Shall we live trustingly, or shall we live suspiciously and cynically? And the truth is, I have lived by um, bearing in mind um, the axiom, you know, somebody once described as a person whose ear was so close to the ground that he couldn't hear what an upright man was saying. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be so streetwise that I mm. suspect everyone. Mm. And I'm afraid that there has been what the academics call the hermeneutics of suspicion. Uh, Marxism, Freudian analysis says never trust what people say. Ask, you know, what power games are at work here? Who's, who's benefiting from whom? So I don't think a culture of cynicism, I mean, the worst thing about being a cynic is that you never get disappointed. You think the world is terrible and you discover it really is. Um, I'd rather not live that way. 
And therefore, I personally have lived trustingly, and I think that is a religious mindset. So let us see people have the courage to stand up and say, to be the head of a big public corporation or a great bank or what have you, is such a worthwhile job that we are looking for the person who will do it for the good he can do for others and not just for him or herself. And if we were honest about that, we would have nobler and better people in positions of leadership in Britain and we would be justified in the trust we have in them. Thank you. Chief Rabbi, thank you very much for your words. Like always, moving with such ease between the cultural and the spiritual and back to economics and religion. When um, the lecture, Karnal Koch lectures and your lecture were scheduled, um, of course there was no question that this was fall into a, such a critical time, at least for Rome. During your speech, it occurred to me that maybe this is providential. I've flown in from Rome this morning, and I can tell you there's a level of insecurity right now in Rome. There's a level of even sadness. This transition that um, leaves us a little bit alone and with a lot of questions. And I find your words, they ring like direction, orientation. 